All right. We fin finished up Daniel chapter 10 last week. And if, well, actually it was two weeks ago. We missed last week. If you recall, that was um, the, I guess, called a vision. Um, Daniel, had, there was a, a heavenly being there that sure sounded a lot, a lot like Jesus, whether it was Jesus or Michael, the archangel, not hundred percent positive, but anyway, um, Daniel, he basically passed out. He, he, uh, he, he was just overcome with the, the the majesty and and uh and then another angelic being touched him and said you know don't be afraid daniel you're you're greatly beloved and he said from the you know from the very moment that you started to pray daniel had been praying for three three weeks if you recall he had been mourning he, he was really in turmoil he was in a lot of trouble or a lot of it, his soul was troubled he was neglecting his health, neglecting, he wasn't eating well. He was neglecting his personal hygiene and so he didn't apply any ointment or wasn't eating any choice food. And, and for three whole weeks, and he's probably, probably if he's like us, he's probably wondering, you know, you know, God, why, why is this happening? Why are you, why am I not hearing from you? And um, it's possible he was um, in trouble, in turmoil because the, the, the captives had been the command had been given that the captives could could go home and the, the temple could be rebuilt but it hadn't this was about three years into it and it still hadn't been, happened that the temple started to rebuild the temple and but the, there was resistance from the enemies and and the uh, there was only a, a remnant of people that returned so there could be a number of things that was causing daniel turmoil but the, the angel came and said, Daniel, you know, do not fear. He said, you're greatly beloved. He said, from the very moment that you began uh, speaking, that you began, that you set your heart on understanding, humbled yourself before your God. And from the very moment you did that and began praying, said your words were heard. He said, but I was with, I was withheld or with, withstood. The Prince of Persia withstood me. And, uh, and they were, if you recall, Daniel's in Persia right now. The Medes and the Persians had just over had just overthrown Babylon. So it's it's the basically it's under the Persian, he's under the Persian Empire now. And it was the Prince of Persia that, that opposed the angel that kept kept him three weeks from answering Daniel's prayer. So, you know, we I think we all took uh, encouragement from that, knowing that when, you know, even if we're not hearing from God, it's not that he's not hearing our prayers. It's, it's that there's a spiritual battle going on that, that we're not even, you know, not even aware of oftentimes. And uh, it's it's interesting that that it was the Prince of Persia that was opposing this this angel. And he, he said that he said it was uh, it was only until Michael he said your prince, Daniel's prince, came. So evidently Michael he's the prince of, of Israel. I, um, if he's if he's Daniel if he's Daniel's prince, evidently there's there's uh, angelic maybe there's angels and demons that are assigned to to different kingdoms, different principalities apparently, because um, they're called powers and principalities. And um, the I find it interesting that um, well, first of all, it's the you know the prince of Persia Persia that opposed the angel why i don't i don't know um i mean that's just what satan and his demons do they they oppose anything associated with god or christ or his people um it could be because you know the angel is going to tell daniel that this that persia is going to be overthrown too so you know persia is only going to be in power for about another 200 and i think it's 208 years and then they're going to be overthrown by greece so that might be one of the reasons why that that, that demonic being was opposing the angel um also do you know and i think you mentioned it once before tom do you know what persia is today what what modern country is it's iran isn't it it's it's iran and yeah. you know throughout history iran and israel have been in, at, at war i mean that, that iran wants to wipe israel off the face of the earth they want to crush them and and put them out into the sea so you know, and this is what 20 2500 years ago Daniel's having this this vision and you know uh persia iran i mean that that battle has, has hasn't ceased since um so 
you know, it's, I guess it shouldn't be a surprise to us when we see, you know, I mean, didn't Jesus tell us in Matthew 24, it says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. They said, don't be surprised. It's going to happen. It's been happening throughout history. It's going to happen until the Lord returns. And, uh, and Satan and his demons, they want to try to destroy his people. And, uh, can I mute you, Mark? Um, no, Jim, I'm, I haven't muted yet. Uh, sorry. Uh, it's okay. Doing that now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I muted you. All right. So, so yeah, the, the Prince of Persia. And then he says, remember the angel also said that the Prince of Greece is, is, uh, is up next. He's going to be coming soon. Let's see, how did he put that? Yeah. The Prince of Greece is about to come and that's going to happen like 208 years later. So um, that's the next world kingdom. He's going to be coming to to, to uh, persecute God's people, and I, I find it. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. What What is that relationship like? I know, I know, Iran and those countries are there's animosity, but is Greece just like a? Is there a good relationship with them? Yeah, yeah, good question. Because I've I've wondered that myself. It, it's not hard to see the you know the the issue the issue with Iran and in right. It's not uh, as inflammatory, right? Yeah. Right now, yes. they did they did the um they did like under Antiochus they they were very much uh, opposed to Israel, and uh -huh. Antiochus is the one who is the the foreshadowing of the of the final antichrist um so perhaps that's perhaps that has something to do with it now he came he didn't come directly from greece remember he came out of one of the four horns one of the four generals remember greece was out alexander the great he basically flew across the world in like i don't know was it like 12 years or something like that and overcame uh, the whole world and then, i'll go ahead do you have something to add oh i say isn't it like you know i ran descendant of uh, ismail like in the bible god said that he's gonna fight again his neighbor his uh, relative right yeah he said he's gonna be a wild donkey of a man and yeah, he's always gonna be fighting against his brothers i believe it said yeah yeah, yeah. yeah good point he and of course that resulted between the the union you know, Abraham and Sarah and they're acting in the flesh trying to help God out with with uh, with with Hagar so you know that's just a, another example of our what our flesh the result of our flesh it, yeah. it's never never results in anything good so yeah thank thank you Hane, for bringing that up um yeah Greece yeah Antiochus um Antiochus the fourth Antiochus Epiphanes um yeah, remember Alexander the Great was uh, was the first king of Greece, and he over he over he uh, became like the ruler of the world. And then when he died, his and this will come up in chapter eleven. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of background now. When when he died, his all his descendants were assassinated, and so his kingdom was spread out. It was parceled out to his four generals, the uh, Seleu Seleucus, Ptolemy. And I can always I always forget the other two because they, they were kind of minor players. But anyway, to the four winds of, of heaven, the four corners of the earth. And then remember, out of one of those came that little horn. And that's Antiochus uh, Epiphanes, the one who's in the fin final Antichrist is going to be a little horn that comes out of one of those 10 uh, kingdoms out of the Roman Empire. So perhaps that's why there's some so much focus on Greece. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, cause I, I wondered that myself, but, but anybody else has any insight, I'd be happy to hear it. But, but Greece, I think Mark pointed out, you know, Greece was used greatly by, by God in order to the uh, Greek language in order to, uh, promote the gospel in the time of Christ. Um, Hellenization, I don't know if you've, you've heard, heard like the the Hellenists, that was uh, a result of the, the, Greek, the Greek empire trying to convert the Jews into the Greek culture. So maybe that's part of it as well, um, trying to make the, the, the Jews more like the Greeks. Um, 
Kind of. Well, I guess that's kind of like, you know, Daniel and his friends, when the Babylonians took them into captivity, they tried to brainwash them. Remember, they tried to change their names, change their God, change their language, change their culture, change their gender. Um, they, you know, they put, they basically brainwash them three years of, uh, you know, Babylon university to try to indoctrinate them into the, into the Babylonian culture. So that the, the Greeks did something similar, um, probably maybe weren't quite as, uh, I don't know, vicious or as the Babylonians, I don't know what the word is I want to use, but, but they, they tried to Hellenize the, the Israelites. I mean, God used the, the Greek language to promote the gospel. So it's a really a robust language. So I don't know. Do you have any more other insight on that, Mark? Yeah, uh, just that the uh, uh, the Roman Empire. I've heard that it was used to. Uh, uh, they were big on infra infrastructure, so they built roads. Right. Uh, to and that. Uh, um, so the Roman Empire helped spread the gospel as well because the uh, use of the roads in between the cities was very easy to uh, to get between the cities that yeah. they've conquered. Yeah, amen. So the amen. gospel was used on those roads. Yeah, amen. And that, and yeah, and that was you know about the time of Christ as well. So yeah, in God's perfect timing, and well, and you've probably all heard that you know the Roman road used as the as a way to present the gospel. You know Romans. 323, 623, 510, I forget what else it is, but but yeah, that's that, probably they call it the Roman road because of what Mark shared that the Romans, it was the Roman, the physical roads that the that helped promote the gospel. So all right. Um yeah. In in, in uh let's see. Chapter 10, it talked about Daniel, Daniel, your prince. I'm not Daniel, Michael, your prince. And then when we get to chapter 12, it's going to talk about Michael again. Michael standing up. And this is after the time of, of great trouble. So it's, this is at the end of really chapter 11 and chapter 12 go hand in hand. It's, it's there really should be no paragraph or no chapter break there. But after after all the conflicts that are listed in, in Daniel chapter 11, it talks about, it says, now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And that's talking about the great, great tribulation that Jesus talked about in, in Matthew 24, uh, that, that time of trouble such as never been before. Michael's going to stand up. There's some, there's some that say that Michael is the respect. <laughs> Bless you, Mike. Some say that Michael is the restrainer in, uh, I believe it's First or Second Thessalonians. Um, but some say that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit. Some say it's the church. Some say it's Michael. Um, but anyway, we'll we'll talk about that another time. But so anyway, um, so yeah, Daniel chapter eleven. And one of the things that's interesting about all these conflicts is as we get through here. Probably I think, oh man, this is a bunch of boring uh trivia, but um there's there's you know reasons why why God included it. One of the reasons is um to just to show his um sovereignty, his omniscience, his I don't even what all the qualities are. That I mean he the the, the details on on these wars, it, it's it's so accurate, so detailed that the the skeptics when they read Daniel, they say, oh, you know, there's no way that Daniel wrote this in, you know, 500 BC. You know, it had to be written after the fact because nobody, you know, there's no way that Daniel could have known this. Well, yeah, there is no human way that Daniel could have known it, but you know, it was only because God had revealed it to him. So anyway, as we go through there, um, you'll see a lot of the conflicts between the the Persians and the Greeks and the and they, you see, like the king of the north and the king of the south. That's part of the uh, Alexander's generals, his his generals that took over his kingdoms. The king of the north and the king of the south. The uh, so it's, yeah, so it's basically going to be the succession of the Persian and, and Grecian empires. The, the kings of Egypt and the kings of Syria come into play. That's where the the king of the south. That's going to be Ptolemy. That's 
that's Egypt. King of the North is Seleucus, and that's Syria. So it's going to transition from Greece, from Persia and Greece to Egypt and Syria, two of the two of the kingdoms that came out of Greece. And then Antiochus is going to come out of this uh, Seleucid, Seleucid Empire out of Syria. And let's see. Oh, yeah, the, the Septuagint. You're, you're all familiar with the Septuagint, aren't you? That's where that was the uh, where the Torah was translated from Hebrew into Greek. That that occurred. It was like around 280 to 250 B.C. And what's interesting, that includes Daniel. Daniel was in the the Septuagint. And so right there, that that destroys the argument by the skeptics that that this Daniel was written. You know, they they claim Daniel had to be written like in 167 BC or or sooner because of all the details that are listed here. But yet Daniel was included in the Septuagint, which was is documented that that was written uh, 250 to 280, 280 to 250 BC. So that was before it was translated into the Septuagint before these events ever happened. So um, anyway, but you know, someone skeptics, if someone doesn't want to believe in Christ, they're, they're not, you're not going to be able to argue them into the kingdom. Their eyes have to be opened by the Holy Spirit. All right. Um, and of course, Jesus in Matthew 24 said that Daniel was the prophet that, that uh, wrote this book. So that if, if you're not going to believe the words, words of Jesus about Daniel, you know, you're not going to believe him, you know, that he rose from the dead either. So, um, you've got bigger issues if you than just believing that the Daniel was written in 500 BC. All right. So yeah, Antiochus the fourth, he was a, he was a cruel, he was a violent persecutor of the Jews. And, uh, but the, one of the points here is that, you know, God sets up one kingdom and he, or he pulls down one kingdom and sets up another there just as, just as he told Daniel in chapter two. And let's see, it's going to be striving against one another. They're going to be deceiving and being deceived just like they're going to, just like it's going to happen up until the end. So, yeah, the first two verses of, of Daniel 11 is talking about Persia. They're the ones that combined with, joined forces with media and, and overthrew Babylon, um, right? That's what led to the end of the Babylonian captivity, like in about 538 BC. So in, in uh, verse 11, what, what's interesting, when I first uh, read this chapter, it says here, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I arose to be an encouragement and, and protection for him. I thought that was Daniel speaking, but when you read further, it's it's not. It sounds like it's the same angel that was speaking in chapter 10, because this is, this is really, actually, you could say chapter 10, 11, 12 all run together, because if you read a little further, he says now i'm going to tell you the truth behold three more kings are going to arise in persia then a fourth will gain far more riches than all of them as soon as he becomes strong so he's continuing the prophecy that it he was telling daniel in chapter 10 so evidently that's the the angel whether it's michael I, or it sounds like it's probably the other angel whether or not that's gabriel i'm, I'm not positive but it sounds like that he arose to be an encouragement and a protection for darius the mede and which seems seems a little odd. Why you know why would he want to encourage Darius the Mede? Why would he why would he want to support because he's was was not a godly king? Um any any thoughts on that? Why would he be it was the first first year of Darius, so it was it was this um apparently it was right after the Babylon was overthrown. So I don't know, was he encouraged? Was he encouraging him because to, I don't know, to, it sounds like he'd already, they'd already overthrown Babylon. So I don't, I don't know. Well, 
Aren't we encouraged to love our enemies? True. Aren't we? And I know you're trying to get at something else. That's why I held off on saying that. But I, yeah, I think that's always supposed to be the godly way. Uh, mm -hmm. True. Yeah. I might give you a an opportunity to give that person guidance, the other person. Good point. Yeah, that that could very well be. Um, it's just like who you are, who he yeah. is. Good, good point. Because Daniel, you know, throughout his captivity, he he was he was well liked by Darius. He was so he was probably encouraging Darius as well. So, yeah, and that was in his favor. Too. Yeah, right, right. So yeah, that's that's a good point, Tom. Yeah, I mean, even if we're working for a uh, you know an ungodly boss or an ungodly government, we're to we're to pray for our kings. Those are in. You know, even if we don't like their policies, we're still to pray for them. So, exactly. and even and, our enemies. Yeah, right. Enemies. I mean, right. I mean, and especially we should be praying for our enemies or those leaders that are that we don't agree with. Pray that God changes their hearts. Change. Pray that God opens their their eyes to to, to truth. So, yeah, good good point, Tom. Um. So yeah, this was given. This was. The first year of Darius, um, which apparently is the same year as chapter nine, chapter nine with the 70 weeks of Daniel says that was the first year of Darius also. Um, it's a little bit confusing because chapter 10 is in the third year of Cyrus, which would have been like five years later. So I'm that's a little confusing for me because it seems like chapter 10 and chapter 11 flow together, but yet here it's, unless that's like a, a flashback, I don't know that he's, that he said in the first year that this is all happening in the third year of Cyrus, but then he's just saying, by the way, back in the first year of Cyrus, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, back in the first year of Darius, I rose to be encouragement and protection for him. I don't know. I'm not sure. It, it almost sounds like it could be that way. Because he says then, and now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings. So I don't know. Jim, is there any other book that has that kind of a pattern, like where it kind of goes, not in chronological order, but even though the chapters are in serial order, but. Yeah. Well, well Daniel and Revelation both are similar they where they're not in chronological order if you if you read revelation you'll find it's like uh basically like one chapter t t describes the end of the world and then a couple chapters later it's like it's describing the end of the world so it's it, and that's okay. been, and that's been the pattern with with daniel where like chapter two talks about all these kingdoms and then it talks about the end where christ is that that rock with that cut without hands is going to destroy them all. And then chapter seven talks about Christ establishing his eternal kingdom again. And in chapter 12 is going to talk about the end again. So yeah, it's, it, it's not, it's not in chronological order, which it kind of is confusing at times, but yeah, good, good question, Sandra. Um, there's probably others. Well, even the gospels, uh, remember there's there's in some cases in the gospels you'll see an account by say by john which seems like things are in a different order than maybe mark's or luke's account but it's it's not a contradiction it's just like um the way they describe the events um i don't know we you know how sometimes when you're you know you're telling a story you, you can't really get all the details in chronological order you have to say oh and you know and by the way while this was happening you know i i don't know it, i do you know what i'm saying yeah i know with the candidate when kennedy got assassinated they'd ask questions and people i mean if you put that timeline together you had a total mess everybody mm -hmm. heard something like in a different order and where it was came coming from and all that it's yeah. just human nature yeah yeah yeah. All right. So, um, so yeah, there's first in verse two, he's talking about the three, the three more Kings are going to arise in Persia. So yeah, there were, 
there were actually there were more than three kings in Persia, but there were only three that were that were prominent. And uh, it's going to be let's see. The, the four kings. The first one is is Cyrus. It's, Cyrus is the one that God used. He prophesied in Isaiah 150 years in advance. The first one was Cyrus, and then the second one is his son uh, Cambyses. I think it's pronounced. And then the third one is going to be another Darius. It's Darius the first. He's he's known also as Darius the Great, and and so that confuses things too because there's there's so many different Dariuses in the Bible. Some of them are Medes, some of them are Persians, and so if you just go by the name, you're 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 going to get confused. And, like Johns and Marys. Yeah, right. Look at how many Johns and Marys there are in the yeah. Bible. Yeah, even Jesus. Yeah, right. So, so yeah, and the fourth, oh, and the fourth king of Persia, you're probably going to recognize. His name was Xerxes the first, also known as Artaxerxes, also known as Ahasuerus. I don't know how you pronounce that. That's the best I can do. Does that, does that ring a bell? Maybe yep. if you read the book of Esther, he's mentioned in there. He's prominent in the book of Esther. That's that's the king of Persia that married Esther. So he's the the fourth king that's going to be mentioned. That's that that uh, Daniel is talking about. Well, actually, it's the angel is talking about. It says three more kings are going to arise in Persia. So those are the three king, the three more kings. The first Cyrus, second Cambyses, the third Darius the Great, and the fourth are Xerxes, the, the one that married Esther. And let's see. There's actually nine more kings in mentioned in scripture for kings of Persia, but they they weren't terribly prominent. And, and supposedly there's a couple more kings that even weren't included in, in scripture. Um let's see. But those are the yeah, those are the those four are mentioned because they're the most prominent as far as the uh, ruling over Israel or dominating Israel, I guess you'd say, um, have, they weren't exactly in, in captivity like in Babylon, but they were pretty much under Persian rule, kind of like the Romans, you know, at the time of time of Jesus, they were under Roman rule. They, I guess you could say they weren't technically captives of, of Rome, but Rome, Rome dominated Israel under the time of Jesus and Rome and Persia dominated Israel for a couple hundred years here. And let's let's go to Esther. Esther chapter one. We'll see about that that fourth king, the Artaxerxes. It's Esther chapter one, just a couple of verses there. I can't even find it. Oh, there it is. Yeah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Esther chapter one, verse one to three, just to refresh your memory. Now it took place in the days of Ahaz, Ahaz, Ahasuerus. This is the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. Oh. In those days, as king Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne, which was in Susa, the capital. Remember Susa, the capital? That was the site of one of Daniel's visions. Mm. He sat on his royal throne, which is in Susa, the capital. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all of his princes and attendants, the army of Persia and Media, the nobles, the princes of his province being in his presence. He displayed the riches of his royal glory. And then... Chapter 2, verse 17, I believe, is where he, yeah, that's where he, he loved Esther. Chapter 2, verse 17, the king loved Esther more than all the other women. She found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vasti. So that's the, that's the fourth king that's mentioned here in Daniel 11, verse 2. Three more kings, and then a fourth is going to gain far more riches than all of them. And that one is, let's see. Yeah. Is that where it is? Let me check my notes.
Yeah, that one's that one's Artaxerxes. He's gained far more riches than all of them. And remember, we just saw in in Esther chapter one how he showed all of his wealth and he showed off all all of his wealth. Esther one. Verse 4, he displayed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor of his great majesty for many days. H half a year he spent just showing off all of his wealth. And he gave a banquet seven days long. All the people in Susa. Okay. There was silver, marble, purple, gold, silver. All right. So, yeah, the, Daniel 11, verse 2. He had far more riches than all the other kings of Persia. I, I believe he in, inherited all those riches from the other kings or whether he inherited them or took them by force, one or the other. Yeah. They came from the prior kings. And let's see. Once he becomes strong through his riches... He came strong through his riches, and he aroused the whole empire against the realm of Greece. So he went and tried to attack Greece. It, uh, the historians say he was he was trying to avenge the defeat at Marathon. You you've heard of the the Battle of Marathon. That's actually where that the the name Marathon comes from for that race, because one of the runners ran like twenty six miles to to bring oh, wow. back news, and they. That's how they, they called it the a marathon. He ran a marathon. That's where that came from. And I think, if I recall, I think he collapsed and died at the end of the 26, however many miles it was that he, to, to get, bring the news back. I have to look that up. I, I'm going well, you to a lot longer than I would have. <laughs> I might have done the 0. 0.2 miles. Somebody else had to do the, the other 26, or whatever it was, something like that. I didn't drive that far. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I guess, I guess he was defeated at, at Marathon in 490 BC. He was defeated. He tried to attack Greece. He was defeated at Salamis. That was 150 years before Alexander the Great came to power. Alexander great, the Great came to power in 330 BC. So that was, uh, so he's, yeah, supposedly the Xerxes stirred up an army of somewhere between uh, a third of a million to two and a half million men, depending on which account you, you go by. So he had a great riches. He had a big army, tried to attack, he attacked Greece, but he, he didn't succeed. He was defeated at a place called Sal Salamis or Salamis, so 150 years before Alexander. So the next king in verse three and four that one you probably recognize. It says, a mighty king will arise. He will rule with great authority and do as he pleases. And that's that's actually like 150 years later. That's referring to Alexander the Great. So there's a, a gap there. I guess there wasn't anything notable for those 150 years. But the next one, that's Alexander the Great, says he'll do as he pleases. He's He was the son of Philip. Remember, uh, Philip was his father. That's where Philippi was named. After, was that named after his father? Yes. You've heard of Philippi. So that was named after Alexander the Great's father. His, his father was a great uh, general in his own right. And remember, he was, Alexander the Great was tutored by Aristotle. His father uh, paid paid Aristotle to, as a private tutor. And yeah, so his father, Philip, hired Aristotle to be Alexander the Great's private tutor. And of course, he taught him in philosophy and religion and and uh and uh anyway, that's yes, yeah, where well, you know, the about Greek Greek philosophy and mythology and all that. That a lot of that comes from those philosophers like Aristotle and Plato, and I don't even know some of the other ones, but you know who they are, probably. And so that was when Alexander was a teenager. Of course, he became general. He was, what was he like? I think he was like 20 when he became general. And he, and he died at around age 33, which is roughly the same age that Christ died. Took him like, I think it was like 13 years to conquer the world. And uh, verse four says, as, as soon as he has risen, 
his kingdom will, will be broken up and parceled out towards the four points of the compass. That's his four generals that we were talking about. The, not, not to his own descendants. His own descendants were all assassinated. And not according to his authority, which he wielded. For his sovereignty will be uprooted and given to others besides them. So remember, he died. He actually died back in, in Babylon. He had gone east, conquered the world as far as India. And he was depressed because there was no more worlds to conquer. So he came planning on coming home. He didn't quite make it. He made, made it back to Babylon. And supposedly he died in Nebuchadnezzar's palace, some kind of mysterious disease. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but he died. He had some interesting last words. We, we talked about that at one time. Um, I forget exactly what all the last words were, but on his deathbed, it sounded like that he realized that, you know, everything he had was, was you know, nothing but dust. It was going to uh, be for naught. I don't know whether he came to faith in the living God or not, but he realized the futility of it all. And it's, it's interesting is, you know, as, you know, we call him Alexander the Great. Everybody has heard of Alexander the Great. There's a whopping two verses about him in <laughs> you know, chapter 11. Doesn't even mention him by name, just calls him a mighty king. He'll rule with great authority, do as he pleases. As soon as he has risen, you know, he only ruled for 13 years. His kingdom was broken up, parceled out towards the four points. So as great as he was, he gets two verses here in chapter 11 just tells you what, what what he learned on his deathbed that it's all futile these yeah, when he games. went to jerusalem right and the priest like read him the scripture did they read him this part saying that he only had 13 years and that his kingdom will be divided yeah great great point he yeah whenever he was whenever he uh, he was conquering the world. He spared Jerusalem because one of the priests, I don't know if it was this chapter or if it was chapter seven, because chapter seven and chapter eight and chapter 11 mentioned the prophecies of Alexander the Great and the history, whether it was Josephus, or I forget which historian uh, recorded what he said, that, that when he was coming through Jerusalem, one of the priests showed Dan, or showed uh, Alexander the Great the prophecy concerning him, and he was so impacted by it that he spared Jerusalem. He did not destroy the city. So that, maybe that's what turned his heart, Heen. So in part, he did believe the scripture saying about him and that, you know, he uh, chose not to destroy it. Good point. So, yeah, good point. He had at least an intellectual belief. Um, perhaps his heart was changed as well. Maybe we'll find out when we, when we, when see. we get to heaven. Yeah, that that would be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, because it appears that Nebuchadnezzar's heart was changed. He appeared to repent on his deathbed as well. So, yeah, yeah. So. That, that should encourage us those that we think are so hard-hearted and so cruel that there's there's hope hope for our our friends our well our enemies or loved ones that seem to be hard-hearted yeah all right yeah alexander came to power quickly but he died quickly too around 323 bc all for nothing except the name mentioned in history. Yep, yep. It doesn't even have an heir to like uh, continue. Right. He didn't want any didn't want any monuments built for him or anything. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yep. And you know, Jim, I mean, it gives you like you know more patience with like you know a friend. Like I have a friend who like you know. And another fan witnessed for her so many years. Now she's like, you know, toward the end of her life, she's turning back to worshiping a living um, idol, like Jing Bai. This lady was born in Vietnam. She had over a million do uh, people follow her. Mm. That's wow. crazy. And she listened to this chanting all day long. Mm. It's sad. It is. Yeah. Yeah, but her heart is hardened but you know still have hope you know yeah. she's she didn't like stop reading yet right yeah as 
as our friend Barb always says, as long as there's life, there's hope. So yeah. 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 yeah if, you, if you remember in Daniel chapter seven, um, Alexander was pictured as the winged, the leopard with wings, leopard with four wings, because he was, he was so swift. He was fast and furious. He like flew across the, the earth without even uh, touching like any, well, that was chapter eight. And when he, the uh, flying goat, remember it was, it was the winged leopard in Daniel seven and he was the flying goat in uh, chapter eight. So yeah, the four is, kingdom was broken up parceled out towards the four winds of heaven or the four points of the compass and that was that's also listed in daniel 7 as well his four generals and yeah it was not his sovereignty was removed it's given to others his children were assassinated his generals took over so then now it's going to talk about the king of the south in verse five and that king of the south is going to be one of his one of Alexander's generals because it says he go his kingdom is broken up to the four points of the compass so the north south east and west and we're mainly going to hear about the north and the south because the ones in the east and the west were relatively weaker they were uh that was Cassander and Lysimachus and I didn't just remember I had it in my notes I had to read but <laughs> so yes Ptolemy and Seleucus were the, the the more powerful ones. Seleucus is the one in the north. Ptolemy is the one in the south. So in in verse four, I'm sorry, verse five, when it's talking about the king of the south, that's going to be Ptolemy. He's the he's going to be the king of Egypt. And then he came. Let's see, he became king. Let's see, it says about 304 BC. Um, and then he died about looks like maybe 20 years later, 19 years later. Now the king of the that's, give part the, of the end king that will attack Israel, uh during like you know the end the uh, war of Armageddon. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're not sure. I mean, there's different theories on who those 10 kings are gonna be, but well, this uh, Rosha definitely is one, and the the Persia, those country, but I don't know the Egypt. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's possible. Yeah, there's there's different theories. Yeah. So, but yeah, the, um, well, Ptolemy, the, yeah, the king of the south, he ruined over Egypt. Plus there was others. It was uh, Libya, Cyrene, Ethiopia, Arabia, Phoenicia, Cyprus, uh, some others that I can't even pronounce. A couple islands many cities in Greece. So that was, that was Ptolemy. He had a pretty big kingdom, but it was primarily Egypt. And uh, yeah, Cassander and Lysimachus, they were relatively insignificant. They didn't impact Israel. So they're not even mentioned anymore. And then out of this kingdom, verse five, it says one of his princes will gain ascendancy over him and obtain dominion says his dominion will be a great dominion so that's um uh, it's one of alexander's princes which is seleucus um i'm not sure why it's just he's described that way but um yeah the king of the south is ptolemy and then the one of his princes gains ascendancy is going to be seleucus i don't know if he was if he was one of ptolemy's maybe he was a son of ptolemy i'm not sure I have to do a little more research on my history. But, uh, let's see. Greece. Okay, Greece conquered Persia and King Darius III under Alexander the Great. At the Battle of Gajamalia, I don't know, I can't. at the Tigris River, it took three years. Let's see. Yeah, Alexander is the one who began the, the process of Hellenization when trying to convert the the uh, Israelites to Roman, uh, to uh, 
Cretan culture. So it, was, it began under Alexander the Great, the Hellenization, and uh, continued through his generals and through, it will continue through Antiochus as well. And remember that that's mentioned in Acts about the Hellenists. Remember in, it was, is it Acts chapter two? When some of the, some of the widows were being neglected. Let's see, where is that? And that's when, that's when they established a, a board of deacons. Do you remember that? It, there was some, some, uh, I think it was the Hellenist widows were being neglected. Let's see, development, let's see, it wouldn't be chapter two. That's not chapter three. Hmm. Oh wow, sorry. I have to Google it. But anyway, do you, do you remember that in, in Acts where the I think it was the, the Hellenists that some of their widows were being neglected and, and Stephen and Philip were two of the deacons that got um elected to 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 provide the fair portion. Yeah. yeah okay chapter six is that it not sure yeah, here, it, here it is it's, here it's it early. Is. yeah it's acts it's acts chapter six the disciples were increasing in number a complaint arose on the part of the hellenistic jews against the native hebrews because their widows were being overlooked at the daily serving of food okay so there's the hellenists they were the hellenistic jews that were those are the ones that alexander the great in, influenced to the the uh, Greek Greek culture. I don't know why they're called Hellenists. Was that a was there a Helen? It must have been a Helen that was a queen or something. Hmm. That's a good question. I, I bet I bet there was somebody named Helen that was prominent. But anyway, so, so the widows were being overlooked, and they established they don't want. He said it's not good for us to neglect the word of God. So we're going to establish uh, deacons. They had to be full of the spirit and Stephen yes yeah, you said he Stephen and Philip and some others so that was that was the Hellenist there I just mentioned that because of the Hellenists it just says it's an adjective that means of or pertaining to Greece it doesn't say mm -hmm. where it actually mm -hmm. came from I mean if that was somebody's name or not I don't yeah know. okay that'll, that'll be my homework assignment for next week because <laughs> I'm curious now where that came from. Uh, and so, yeah. So Alexander, yeah, he began the Hellenization process. And as Mark mentioned, that also God providentially used the, the Greek language to, to spread the gospel. And yeah, that, um, let's see. And, and as he said, the, that, that, that Israeli priest showed Daniel the prophecy and he spared, he had mercy on the city. All right. So you're going to see the yeah, battles here between the king of the north and the king of the south. Of course, Israel is in between. So Israel is going to be caught in the middle of these, these battles this whole time. Uh, I guess you'd say that Israel is the prize or Jerusalem is a prize and you know they're still battling over Israel today um, there was at, at least five major wars in the 300 BCs between the king of the north and the king of the south with Israel in the middle so then yeah Egypt Ptolemy the king of the south he became a world leader over Israel in around 304 BC that's in uh, that's in Daniel chapter two. Remember the, the the statue, the bronze, the head of gold, the what was it, the the silver, the bronze, the uh, was it the bronze with the two arms? Let's see. Well, the Medo Persians, yeah, the Medo Persians would have been the the bronze, and then it's chapter two, verse. 
32. The he head of gold, the breast of silver, the belly, okay, that's it, the thighs. The belly and thighs were bronze. So the, the belly and thighs, that's that's Greece, but then the two thighs are the two, the way it's split off into those two kingdoms, the the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, the king of the south and the king of the north. And then chapter seven talked about it. Chapter seven, verse six talked about the leopard with his four wings and his four heads. So the four heads were those four four kings, those four generals of Alexander. And in verse 17, these four four great beasts are four kings. And then chapter 8, verse 8, talks about the goat. That goat is Greece with the one horn. The large horn is Alexander the Great. That, that large horn is broken in its place. There came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. That's the same four generals of Alexander. And then 8.22 talks about the, the broken horn, the four horns that rose, or the four kingdoms arise from his nations, although not with his power. So they didn't have the, the power that Alexander had, but they spread to the four points of the compass. And is that a good place to stop? It's about five. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. So... I don't know what our lesson is for today. Um, anybody gain any insights? God had planned for everything that he uh, do, including using, you know, um, things that you don't deem good or uh, righteous to complete his plan. Yeah, good, good so point. You see from the beginning to the end, so it's just... You know, even though we in the where the park where it's bad, just keep trusting. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, God's got a plan. He's gonna use he's gonna use sinful people, isn't he? I mean, that's that's other than Jesus, that's all he has is sinful people. So he's gonna use even the, the ungodly kingdoms. Yeah. Yeah. Not just the believer that uh, to do his good work, but also the evil people to do his good work. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Mark, did you have something to share? Um, just, uh, just adding on to that, God, you know, raises one up and sets another down. Yeah. So it's Amen. It's His plan. Yeah, yeah, and that's something that I need to keep in mind. I think all of us do when, yeah, you know, when we see the, you know, the troubles in the world, the troubles in this country, the political issues that we don't agree with. That you know, God's sovereign; He can raise them up he can tear them down so yeah th thank you mark yeah especially now we don't even have any like capable uh candidate for the next election hmm. Absolutely. but yeah. he's in control amen yeah boy yeah, if we can have our hope in christ it would be a scary place yes it would be. yeah S sandra what do you have to add yeah, like you were saying, you know, it just makes me realize that how God is aware of everything, like as much as we don't agree with the current government, um, you know, um, I remember one time I went for a, I was going to church for a prayer meeting, and I don't know, um, I know Joe Biden, but I don't know, uh, I know he has a wife, but I don't know any details about his children or anything like that, and um all of a sudden, I'm going on the way to get to church, and I heard the Holy Spirit um, say, Joe Biden's daughter, mm -hmm. and, you know, to pray for her. And so I didn't even know that he had a daughter. And then when I looked up, I then found out that apparently, like, you know, he lost um, in an accident, he lost uh, some of his family before, and currently his daughter is with his, um, you know, present wife. And um, so I was just marveling at how um, God knows everything, you know, um, and how he is so in charge of everything and all the details. And he cares, like Keen said, you know, he can do his good work even through um, like people who are not in line with the Bible and things like that. Amen. Thank you, Sandra. Don Donette, do you have anything to add? 
I just like how he, you know, ties everything in with the history. So, um, you know, these people are, were real. Um, right. It just helps you understand and get the timing um, to understand his message. Um, just like what you were saying about Daniel and folks not believing that he prophesied that it kind of makes it clear then when he ties things back to history. It's just <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Amen. Thank yeah. Thank you, Donette. Yeah. It makes it, I don't know. It, it just makes God's word come alive. It's not just a bunch of myths and fables and, you know, fairy tales. It's, I mean, this is real life and, and God yeah. can be trusted. Yeah. Also, God is so detail oriented, and mm -hmm. a lot of what He speaks is often so symbolic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Amen. Yeah, He's a God of details. Isn't he? All right. Hello? All right. Anybody like to pray for us? Sure, I will. Thanks, Andrew. Father God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are still on the throne. And no matter what we face in this life here on this earth, um, help us to keep our gaze fixed on you. Um, and you will keep us in perfect peace, Lord. And um, um, help us to keep on trusting in you, just like Heen said. Um, help us to keep on keeping on. And um, like you say in your word in Galatians 6, 9, that... Um, uh, when we don't give up and we don't grow weary in doing good uh, in due season, we will reap the reward for it, Lord, and um, um, help us in that, Holy Spirit. And um, we pray for each one of us here and our families. We commit ourselves into your hands, Father. Help us to um, press on. And uh, we pray, Father, that we will leave a rich legacy even for our children and generations to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Sandra. All right. Well, thank you, Thanks, everybody. Man. You bet. All right. Well, y'all have a blessed week, and uh, we'll keep trusting the Lord in the midst of all the things we see out in the world. Thank you. You too. Thank you, John. All right. All right. Bye bye. Bye.